Hello, crazy peoples. You're definitely crazy if you're listening to us. Buongiorno. <laughs> oh, I said that into my milkshake. Lovely. I didn't want to eat my dessert, so I bought it in drink form. Wow, that oh was beautiful. God, at the end. That was gorgeous. So. That should be the intro. <laughs> oh, that one's way worse. Okay, I'm done. You done now? No, hold on. There's still more now. All right. Oh, my God, bro. <laughs> I'm ready. You're tell ready? Me, tell me the- So, Rose. So, Chelsea. Where um, did you eat this week? Where did I eat this week? Oh, my gosh. One of my favorite little mini chains. I went to Pie Minister. Um, it is Pie Minister. Are you yes. sure it's not Pie Minster? I swear There's it another, is. It's like Pie Mini Stir. That's how it's spelled. Aw, I was wrong. I know. I kept I, when I first went to it because I I've been there twice now. I thought it was Pie Minister, but it's Pie Minister because it has that extra I. Mm, interesting. Any, any hooser. <laughs> it is located here in Manchester, on Fifty Third Church Street. I think it's not. It's in the northern quarter. It is amazing. It's like the atmosphere is really nice. It's kind of relaxed. Um, you see yourself exposed brick kind of like dive bar kind of vibe. Mm, that sounds cozy. <laughs> yeah, it is very cozy. And then they have like a little like deli window so you can look at the kind of pies that they have. And you're like, oh, my God, I want to eat uh, all so- the freaking pies. I would love a chicken pot pie right now. Oh, my gosh. Excuse me. Oh, my God. I have one in the freezer and I'm like so ready for it. Mm. They're I mean, their pies are great. It's. Probably one of the best places to go, like, on a cold, kind of rainy day. Because it's just, like, when you eat their pies, it, like, warms your whole body. I feel like I need to specify, these are meat pies, correct? Yes, these are meat pies. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm just going and, like, eating, like, whole pies. (laughs) A whole apple pie all by yourself. A whole apple pie. Yeah, these are savory pies, um, like pot pies and stuff like that. They're really cool because they do have like a lot of vegan and vegetarian pies, which I've never had because I'm not those people. They do have like a really good like selection of savory um, vegan and vegetarian pies. They also offer gluten-free pies. I had... I don't remember. <laughs> I had a moo pie. Wow. I was just like, my brain stopped working. I had a moo pie. It's called a moo pie, like a cow. Moo. Um, Thank you for that. It's, you're welcome. It's a, a made with British beef steak and craft ale. Mm. Oh, my gosh. It was just so hearty and flavorful. And the crust was like flaky. And it was just like perfect. And it was sitting on a bed of mashed potatoes. Oh, that's beautiful. I can see it myself. It's the way that God intended it to happen. (gasps) Wait, is this the video that you shared on Snapchat the other day? Yes, I did. Oh my gosh, we have to put that on the website. It looks so good. Not ashamed. I loved it. (laughs) And then I had uh, regular garden peas because I don't like minty, mushy peas. It's an acquired taste that I don't have yet, guys. Okay? I don't want to hear from anybody. Peas have to have a little pop to them. I know, I don't, but the mint is like, it's not mint, like a spearmint gum. It's just like, I don't know. It's a acquired taste. I might get there one day, but I'm just not ready for it. So I just had plain peas (laughs) Um, (laughs) with butter on them. And I also ordered uh, their mac and cheese because I was really just like feeding for some mac and cheese. And not a lot of places make mac and cheese. And their mac and cheese is not that bad. It's not the best mac and cheese, but I needed mac and cheese in my life. I was missing it. It's been a while since I've had some good mac and cheese. Mac and some, cheese is a very American staple. Yeah, some um, some Panera 
white cheddar. Oh my gosh. Oh, stop that. Oh my god, so good. Um, I miss it. Um, first thing there's, I come home for Christmas, I'm like, where's the Panera? <laughs> there's Panera, Panera right down the street from my apartment, and I'm about to go get some food right now. Panera, said that. sponsor us. <laughs> sponsor us, Panera. <laughs> but it's overall, like, relaxed. Um, there was a doggy in there, and they have little doggy treats for, like, doggies, and I was just like, uh, oh let me gosh. take you home. Please. And they do have beers and stuff but because i don't have you there with me i don't want to buy a beer and then it'd just be like a yucky one <laughs> what because um, <laughs> then i'm not there to drink it because you don't like it basically yeah <laughs> i didn't get extra gravy because i like myself some some tasty brown gravy chelsea doesn't like brown gravy brown gravy is an abomination but no it's not it's the way the lord intended it white um, gravy rose every day. no well, I like that, too. I like all gravy. I don't discriminate. Unlike um, some people. I do. Um, <laughs> Very discriminatory <laughs> about gravy. <laughs> the, f- the first time I went, I did have an elderflower lemonade. This is the second Lemon- elderflower drink you've had on this show. Listen, okay, I have a weakness, and its name is elderflower. I have a giant bottle right next to me of rose elderflower water. Oh, okay. my gosh. <laughs> It's my favorite. When I get married to myself one day, I'm going to have an elderflower cake oh. and everything's <laughs> going to be amazing. Um, and then I did have a dessert. I had sticky toffee pudding with ice cream. Mm. It was delightful. It was warm. It was all the things you wanted a toffee pudding to be. Oh, my gosh. Chelsea, who doesn't know what a toffee pudding is, I don't know how to describe it. It's like a cake with melted toffee on it and ice cream. <laughs> You make it sound like I don't know. I can picture it perfectly. I don't know. It you sounds... might not have never had it. It's so good. I mean, it sounds <laughs> pretty self-explanatory, but it sounds so good. It was good, and I needed it because it was extra freezing that day. The first time I went, it was, like, rainy and cold. And then the second time I went, it was just, like, so cold I could see my breath outside. And I was just like, I just want this pie, damn it. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> We haven't had but, yeah. cold like that since, like, until yesterday. That was a convoluted sentence. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, as we record this, um, I know it happened a few weeks by the time anybody hears this ago. Um, <laughs> it's, that, fi- it's finally cold enough to see your breath in Portland. By the time anybody hears this in Portland, it'll be like, um, what are you talking about? It's been freezing for weeks now. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> this week is supposed to be one of the coldest weeks um, in the UK. Oh, my uh, God. Like, of, first of the season, I guess you could say. And it's supposed to snow, like, all over. And I was looking at the map, and I was like, please, God, all I want is some snow. And, and I look at the map, and Manchester's, like, on the line of rain and snow we're not getting no. any snow <laughs> so i was like what's the point of it gonna if it's gonna be cold you don't get snow. it needs to snow it needs to snow that's that's the rules okay M- mother nature Otherwise, doesn't agree with you don't bother being cold if you're not gonna snow but that's well, part- i've got a running angry letter to mother nature so if you want to add on to it <laughs> I'll put it, I'll put, I'll put my name on it. Put, Petition. On, put it on the list. <laughs> Bring back snow 2020. Um, <laughs> it didn't go anywhere. Um, but yeah, that's Pie Minister. Uh, they have other locations. That's the only one I've been to. But they're, they're just like kind of like a small kind of chain. But it was lovely and I loved it. And if you haven't gone, I highly recommend it. If you try looking up to see if you have one in your area, I think there's one in a couple in Liverpool, just just go. Especially since just it's getting cold outside. Go. She's very passionate about it. <laughs> very passionate about it. Don't go when I go, because I want to get my food faster. I don't, don't like to wait. I can't be recognized <laughs> or anything. Yes. So that was my pie, and Chelsea is now going to tell us her story for this happy Thanksgiving all right, Rose, are you ready for my story? Yes, I am. Okay. Story time. Yay. Yeah. Um, hi, guys. Welcome to Dinner Hello. Order. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, if you don't know by now, I'm Chelsea. I'm Rose. 
it, we're on episode five. We are today. We have a special Thanksgiving episode for you guys. Thanksgiving. Which I don't recommend listening to at dinner time. I don't recommend listening to it around or near your relatives. <laughs> that too. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what Chelsea's doing, but I can just imagine. Yes. It's no bueno because she's got a true crime this week. I do. Our first like modern e time true crime, right? No, it's not. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. I realized as I was researching my next episode, uh, which will come out next week, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, I realized when I was researching that one that all of our episodes to this point have been super historical, not even in the 20th century. So I'm really sorry. It's not a theme. We just, we got overexcited with all these old cases. Yeah, well, I mean, last week's is the Penhurst episode. At least that happened in the 20th century. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> that, that happened in the 20th century, but it's still kind of old. I yeah. mean, it's not a true crime, I guess. I would uh, argue that it definitely is true crime. I mean, yeah, definitely criminally. Crimes against humanity. <sighs> crimes against humanity. Well, happy Thanksgiving. I bought a turkey. You bought a turkey? Yeah, oh, I bought a turkey breast. Okay, I was about to say, you bought a bird? <laughs> no, why would I buy a bird? Well, you said you bought a turkey. Like, that's all you said. Well, when you buy a turkey, what do you say? When I buy a whole bird or when I buy, like, deli meat turkey? When you buy, like, the turkey that you get for Thanksgiving. I say I bought a turkey. See, I said I bought a turkey and you thought I bought a bird. Yeah, like, that's the whole damn bird. Oh, you mean, like, I bought a, a raw bird, not... <laughs> yes, like, an entire... Not a living bird. Like the I thought you were like, you bought a bird? <laughs> you bought, like, the entire animal, not just, like, turkey breast or shaved deli turkey. No, I bought I bought a turkey breast. See, that that makes more sense. All right, um... Okay, off our tangent. Here's a, here's a tangent. Well, we hope that you guys are all going to enjoy your turkey and... Ham, people eat that, right, on Thanksgiving? I do. And mac and cheese and mashed potatoes and gravy. Mm, gravy. <laughs> Thank you for loving me. Thank you for <laughs> being there. Cram. I was going to say craisins. But <laughs> <laughs> cranberry sauce. <laughs> cranberry sauce. <laughs> cranberry sauce. You're a terrible I Bob's love, fan. Oh, I just started watching Bob's Burgers. Really? Oh, Rose. Yeah. I'm only on like episode seven of the first season. Linda's songs are just the best part of the entire series. Yeah. I can already be like, what? I'm sorry. My brain stopped working in the middle of that sentence. <laughs> I didn't even drink yet, guys. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. All right. Let me. Yeah. Up. Okay. So just enjoy all of your Thanksgiving food. Eat enough for me because I won't be having Thanksgiving with my family this year. Tiny, insert tiny violin sound. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. Chelsea has Thanksgiving with her husband every year. I do. And since it's, since it's just us, we eat whatever the hell we want. Lame. How's that lame? That's awesome. No, I want turkey. I <laughs> and mash, mash the taters. Okay. Okay, let's go. Tell me what you're going to tell me today. I mean, tell me the stuff. All right, let's jump into it. This yes. week... In our special Thanksgiving episode, I am talking about the Kentucky cannibal Boone Helm. Yum. Oh, it's, it's, it's he's a special dude. Cannibals make me vomit. This one, <laughs> I mean, compared to other cannibals that I've researched, he's not, I don't want to say not that bad because any kind of murder is bad but he's he's the story isn't as gruesome because it's so old okay so what what year are we talking his his name was boone helm he was a serial killer and cannibal and he committed his crimes from 1850 to 1864 okay in the old west he and has the cowboys 
Yeah, he has at least 11 victims, but the total's unknown because it was the Old West. Everybody was just killing everybody anyway. Basically. There's no rules. There's, <laughs> there's one rule. Put your shirt back on. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I would like to start by saying that whoever wrote the Wikipedia article about Boonhelm is a literary genius. I hope this is the only time I'm going to say this in our podcast, but this is a direct quote from the synopsis of the Wikipedia article. <clears throat> quote, Helm was a serial killer who gained his nickname for his opportunistic and unrepentant proclivity for the consumption of human flesh taken from the bodies of enemies and traveling companions. While this was usually done in survival situations, Helm sometimes took flesh in preparation for a survival situation. Unquote. Cute. So with that fresh in your mind... Helm was born on January 28th in either 1827 or 1828. Uh, there's differing accounts of when he was born. General consensus is that he was born in 1827. However, there is a forum, uh, findagrave.com, where a relative, a distant relative, says that he was born in 1828. So I'm usually more inclined to believe the blood relative, but that's just me. Uh, he was born in Kentucky to what appeared to be a normal loving family. <laughs> Appearances can be deceiving. Yeah, also it was the 19th century, so what's a loving family? <laughs> Honestly, I suspect there must have been some kind of abuse behind closed doors and probably an undiagnosed mental illness. But Probably. Yeah, of course mental illness wasn't understood back then, so... It's not like he would have been diagnosed even if he had, you know, help. He just ended up in a place like Penhurst. Oh, geez. Dun, dun, dun. <sighs> the Helm family moved uh, from Kentucky to Missouri when Helm was a young boy. Based on his behavior, it seems to me like Helm was a very self-conscious child. He took every opportunity to show off his strength and manliness. He was very competitive and often challenged people to fights. This is what makes me believe he may have been abused by his father or another male authoritative figure, because a lot of young boys that are abused by their fathers feel like they need to overcompensate in public to present themselves yeah. as a big, strong man because they don't feel like that at home. Yes. Yes. Helm was very much a show off. He liked having attention and feeling tough. An article about Helm written in 1907 says, quote, He was of powerful build and turbulent temper, delighting in nothing so much as feats of strength, skill, and hardihood. His community was glad to be rid of him, as was, indeed, any community in which he ever lived. Unquote. I'll be quoting that article a lot because, I mean, their wording is just so colorful. I can't reproduce it on my own. I know. I was just like, wow. I know. It's, <laughs> it's so it's so beautiful for somebody so horrible. I know. He is said to have had contempt for authority. Once when a sheriff tried to mm. arrest him, he refused to dismount his horse and even rode it up the stairs and into the courthouse, <laughs> which was in session to heckle the judge. I thought it was going to be like a high speed horse chase. <laughs> Bro. He rode, he rode his horse up a flight of stairs into the courthouse to tell the judge he was being an asshole. Basically, exactly what I would have done in that scenario. That's not over-exaggerating at all. No? Oh my god, it sounds like um, Grand Theft Auto circa 19th century. Circa 19th century. That's so dramatic, I swear. <laughs> Is so dramatic, and it gets more dramatic. When he was 21 or 22, he married 17-year-old Lucinda Browning and quickly got her pregnant. Shocker. Mm, as you do. As you do. He became known for heavy drinking, 
riding his horse into the house and beating his wife. What is what is with the horse in the house thing? The horse is clearly his best friend. The horse doesn't belong inside, okay? Inside the stables, but not inside the houses. Beating his wife. Beating his <laughs> wife, yes. I imagine he probably did so from the horse if he rode the whole animal into the house. That's excessive, but okay. Yeah, you'd think so. Well, Lucinda didn't like it. She soon petitioned for divorce, and Helm's father paid for the legal fees. The divorce, yeah. think of it this way, this is probably the 1840s at this point, and Helm was so bad that his own family said, yeah, we'll agree to the divorce. <laughs> Ridiculous. Back when no one ever divorced. You stayed miserable or you died. Or you died. <laughs> Dramatic. That's what happened back then. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> the divorce bankrupted Helm's family, so, like a good son, he ran away. As you do. As you do. He moved to California. He had only been married for about two years. Wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> this brings us to 1850. This is when... That's a jump. Yeah, I, I mean, there's, there's no distinct timeline from his childhood until now. But... There's, what, wait, what happened to his baby, though? Oh, his wife and daughter left, and there's no record oh. of them. And, it, like, after that? No, no record of them after that. I imagine they probably no. changed their names and went into hiding. Hopefully they like she remarried a really nice man. I really hope so. Took care of her daughter. All right. Back to the man. Back to the man. The cannibal man. Yeah. 1850 is. Um, well, if his life hadn't already taken a nosedive, 1850 is where it started. Yay. Yeah. In 1850, Helm committed his first murder. He wanted to go to California as it was the height of the gold rush. It's where you want to be. And money, money, money. Money, money. And he asked his cousin, Little Barry Shoot, to come with him. Little I just, Barry Shoot. I can't get over that name. It's a cute name. Yeah. <laughs> I'll name my first friend, Little Barry Shoot. Well, Little Barry initially agreed to go with him to California, but then he changed his mind. So Helm stabbed him in the chest and set out west on his own. That's an appropriate response. <laughs> Perfectly appropriate. Everything that I read says that shoot was killed instantly, but I find it really hard to believe that a stab wound can instantly kill someone. Yeah, if you hit an artery. I guess so, but even it, then it takes if, a few seconds. Yeah, that's as instant as you can, unless you like fell from like a hundred story building and he died instantly. Yeah. Anyway, he died. He died. That was Helm's first murder. Well, at least he didn't eat him. No, he did not. Helm killed his cousin and then started out west, but his cousin's friends and relatives obviously found the body very quickly and went on a manhunt for him. <laughs> they caught him pretty quickly after the murder. They caught Helm. I'm not. Wow. Yeah. I'm not sure what they initially intended to do with him. Uh, I imagine they were just going to uh, go for vigilante justice. But maybe <laughs> they held him captive for a bit, thought he was crazy and had him committed to an asylum for the mentally deranged. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I called it. I mean, we all know what lovely healing places asylums were in the 19th century. They were. The height of mental health care. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. In the asylum, Helm changed his demeanor completely. He became quiet and acted very reserved and well-behaved. He convinced the guards to allow him to go on supervised walks in the woods. He did this for a while until it was routine. And then he tricked the guards and escaped during one of their walks. Of course. Oh, my God. Naturally. I mean, that seems pretty, pretty lax rules for an asylum of that time. I'm surprised he got away with that. Yeah. From the asylum. That's he, weird. Yeah, it is weird. From the asylum, he made his way towards California. 
On his journey, he murdered several men in altercations, eventually working his way up to premeditated murder. He was constantly on the move to avoid vigilante justice. At this time in the West, um, there was not a strong law enforcement presence. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of police, and the police didn't have all that much power. So there was a lot of vigilante justice happening. People were just taking the law into their own hands. Yeah. The West was crazy, man. I mean, it was the Wild West. In 1853, he went to the Dales, Oregon, which is about an hour east of where I live right now. Put that in perspective. Kind of creepy. There, he teamed up with six men that were heading towards Salt Lake City, Utah, and confided in them that he had killed and eaten parts of his victims. And Yuck. And for some reason, they kept traveling with him? They were like, this is normal. We all have eaten people. That's totally normal, man. Do what you gotta do. Hey, when a man's gotta eat, you gotta eat. Mm. One of the- my stomach turned. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So gross. One of the men must have kept a journal because Helm is quoted as saying, quote, Many's the poor devil I've killed at one time or another, and the time has been that I've been obliged to feed on some of them. Unquote. Yuck. I, somehow that quote was recovered, even though every man that he traveled with ended up dead. Every man. <laughs> Words from beyond the grave. That's, that's why I think there must have been a journal at some point, And he was like, oh, I'll take this with me. He's just, like, writing down his own quotes, his own sayings, inside of a journal. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> On the way to Fort Hall, Idaho, the group was attacked by Native Americans, and they were forced off the road and into the wilderness. Good. Warning. The next part is upsetting. Cute. Ready for it. Hit me. If you can't handle animal abuse, skip ahead 15 seconds. No! <laughs> to survive, they killed their horses, ate their meat, and made no. their hides into snowshoes. Why? <sighs> the horses only I doing it. their job. I know. Imagine you're just doing your job and driving around people, and then they kill you and turn you into shoes. I know. I read one account that said they rode the horses until they were exhausted, and then they killed them. That's even worse. I know. I don't know how many of the original seven men were killed by Native Americans, and how many died in the wilderness, but all but two died on the journey. Helm and a man named Burton. When Burton could no longer travel, the two stopped at an abandoned cabin... Helm left Burton there and went ahead to see if he could find civilization, but found another abandoned building, so he turned back to where he'd left Burton. While collecting firewood, Helm heard a gunshot and returned to the cabin to find that Burton had shot himself in the head to avoid a slow, painful death in the wilderness. That's sad. I know. But, so this dude was just chilling out with this guy who was eating all his friends and he was totally okay with it, or was he eating them too? I don't think Helm cannibalized any of the people on this expedition to this point okay but again there is not a whole lot of information known about this because obviously they were in the wilderness after burton was dead helm you know wouldn't waste an opportunity so you ate him so he <laughs> severed burton's legs ate one of them there at the cabin and then packed the other to bring with him on his journey. Just nomming on some legs. Oh my god. Mm hmm So he continued his journey by himself. John W. Powell discovered Helm at a Native American camp sometime later and allowed Helm to accompany him. Despite having $1,400 which is 42683 in today's money, or for... Mm. Yeah, right? That's a lot of money. Despite having all of that money on him, Helm didn't pay or thank Powell for housing, clothing, and feeding him all the way to Salt Lake City. Rude. So rude. 
I don't like this guy. He's eating people. He doesn't have manners. No manners. He became a killer for hire in Salt Lake City, killing men that the Mormons, quote, wanted removed. The Mormons? The Mormon. Well, yes. Salt Lake City was a Mormon civilization. I think it's still. Is it not still? It's still. I don't know. They're all up. There's a very large Mormon population there still, but it's not, you know, exclusively a Mormon civilization anymore. I I didn't know that Mormons had it in them to hire assassins. Well, you know, according to this newspaper, they sure did. When he became one, yeah. When he became wanted by the law, he fled to San Francisco, California, where he met a rancher that agreed to take him in and shelter him from the law. Helm killed him too. Oh my God! Literally, no manners. No southern hospitality. I know it's not his place, but dang. Not at all. From there, he went back to Oregon and robbed people for a living, often killing the people that he robbed. Oh my goodness. In 1862, Helm got drunk in a saloon and shot and killed an unarmed man named Dutch Fred before fleeing town. Some people believe this may have been another contract killing, but nothing is known for sure because it's undisputed that Helm was really drunk at the time. He's just so good at his job, he can still hit his mark. Apparently. While on the run for Fred's murder, Helm made it to British Columbia, Canada, accompanied by another fugitive. This dude is just going everywhere. He's all over the West Coast. He's making moves for the time period he is in. Seriously. Like, this... after getting lost in the woods, that'd be the last time I go out. I mean, these travels must be taking him years. Just a really long time. He's a he's a well-traveled man. <laughs> so he made it to Canada with this other guy who was accompanying him, and he killed and ate that man also. Oh my goodness. Supposedly he did so in British Columbia. Now we're committing crimes internationally. Internationally. At the time... Canada was still a colony of Great Britain, so he was caught by British authorities and sent back to Portland, Oregon, quote, for safekeeping. That's almost where you live. That's too close for comfort, honestly. I mean, he's not still alive. I mean, it'd be kind of weird if he was. (laughs) A bit, yeah. Just a little bit. He's like 200 years old. While in custody, and with a trial being put together for Fred's murder, Helm wrote to his brother, only known as Old Tex, and asked for help. Old Tex paid off all the witnesses with a, quote, considerable amount of money, unquote. Oh my god. Wait, I thought the family was in debt. That's what I thought, too. Apparently, they've had enough time to recoup their finances because he had enough money to pay off all the witnesses of this murder. Ridiculous. Without witnesses, law enforcement had no case against Helm, so they were forced to release him to his brother's custody. The two of them went to Texas. It's not known how long Helm and his brother traveled together after his release from jail, but... It's assumed that Helm continued to travel after going to Texas with old Tex. We're not even sure if he made it to Texas, but that's where they were headed after Portland. He killed people almost everywhere he went until he was finally captured by vigilantes in Montana. In Montana? In Montana. So I think this is where the story gets good. Give me the juicy deets. So this is the aftermath of Boone Helm's life of crime. By the time he showed up in Montana, he had wormed his way into the Henry Plummer gang. Helm and four other gang members were captured and tried by the vigilantes of the town. At the trial, Helm is said to have blamed many of his own crimes on his other gang members. Naturally. Naturally. He's just a scapegoat kind of guy. Here's a quote from the 1907 article that I mentioned earlier. Quote, He claimed not to know what was wanted of him when brought before the judges of the vigilante court and solemnly declared that he had never killed a man in all his life. 
They made him kiss the Bible and swear to this over again just to see to what lengths his perjured and depraved soul would go. He swore on the Bible with perfect calmness, unquote. Okay. <laughs> I've never killed a man before, but on my resume, you can see here, man, <laughs> like, contract killer. <laughs> I mean, he, he blamed the contract killing on the other gang members. Oh my gosh. He oh said, my goodness. He said, not only have I never killed a man before, I've never accepted money for it either. Those guys did. How? Me? And like the vigilantes knew that he was lying through his teeth, but they wanted to see if he would go so far as swearing on the Bible about it. And he did. And that's when everybody was like, oh, he lied and he didn't burst into flames. He didn't. I mean, he already knew he was going to hell, so he was going to enjoy the ride there, apparently. Apparently. He then called over one of the men trying him, so one of the vigilantes, and whispered to him that he was a murderer and had been to jail a few times. But he said he had never been a contract killer. That was his friends over there. Weird. And then he put his face off. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, God. He's... I'm so dramatic. He's such a... I don't have the right word for him at the moment. I'll like think of it. Like a narcissist? I don't no, know. that's not the word. No. A narcissist yeah, is just... kind of. It's like... A narcissist is just proud of what they do, though, aren't they? No, uh, it's... There's a whole thing with narcissism. Um, kind of, in a way. Like, he's just toying with people. He's, like, holding that power with the... I didn't kill anybody. Kind of like Ted Bundy. I've never killed anybody <laughs> mm, that's a good point then, that's a good point yeah. yeah he probably was narcissistic i imagine he probably ticked off quite a few boxes on the psychopathy checklist too probably i mean he he does you know eat people another quote from the article quote jack gallagher also under arrest heard him thus incriminate himself and others of the gang and called him all the names in the calendar telling him he ought to die unquote all the names in the calendar. All the names in the calendar. That's a new idiom for me. I feel like it's probably where all the names in the book come from. Probably. Comes from. I've I called him everything in the book. <laughs> so after this quote unquote trial, the vigilantes were like, you guys are full of shit. We're going to kill all of you. The vigilantes hanged all of the captured gang members on January 14th, 1864, allegedly in front of a crowd of 6,000 people. That's more people than ever existed on Earth at that time. That's, That's not true, but... <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of people for a, a small frontier town, for sure. I think prob yeah. probably people from, you know, towns over came to watch this execution. Um, yeah, I guess there wasn't much to do, so they were like, oh, let's... Honey, there's an execution this weekend. <gasps> we have to go. <laughs> I mean, it was prime entertainment. We have to go early, not like last time. Every time we get there late, we don't have good seats. <laughs> it's it's like a million ways to die in the West. Yes, it's like entertainment, and at the same time, it's also like, uh, a, like a weird deterrent. Like, yeah, don't you be doing some stuff because this will be you. Weirdly enough, they were not convicted of murder. They were convicted for trying to burn down the city of. Virginia City, Montana. Interesting. So... Can we really call it convicted? It wasn't, like, in a real court. It was no. Just a bunch of vigilantes were like... It was not. All right. <laughs> Let's just kill them. They were said to have been killed for that reason, not for the fact that they were cold-blooded killers. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a so lot. So the victims don't really get justice. No, the victims never actually get justice in this case. Which is really sad. Mm. A lot of them aren't even named there's there's no way to tell who these people were there's they're just lost to time so he just like murdered a bunch of people and then ate some of them yeah he ate the ones that were convenient or that he felt like he needed provisions for a trip so okay interesting weird yeah very weird helm was reportedly very theatrical while he waited his turn at the gallows of course of course. I mean, what's left for you other than being a drama queen? It's expected. I mean, if you're being hanged, you may as well go out. With a bang. With a bang. 
And rhymes. Okay. They were, <laughs> they were all hanged from a beam of a half-finished building. The front facade of the building hadn't been finished yet, so it was open to the street, open to the rest of the town. So the okay. men were lined up standing on boxes with nooses around their necks. So bear with me. This is a long quote, but it's better than anything I could have written myself. The article from 1907 that I read Quote, Boone Helm looked around at his friends placed for death and told Jack Gallagher to stop making such a fuss. There's no use being afraid to die, said he. And indeed, there probably never lived a man more actually devoid of all sense of fear. He valued neither the life of others nor his own. He saw that the end had come and was careless about the rest. He had a sore finger which was tied up. And this seemed to trouble him more than anything else. Wow. So he was more upset that his finger hurt than the fact that he was about to die. Okay. Uh, back into it. There was some delay about the confessions and the last offices of those who prayed for the condemned. And this seemed to irritate Boone Helm. For God's sake, said he, if you're going to hang me, I want you to do it and get through with it. If not, I want you to tie up my finger for me. <laughs> He was like, get with it, okay? My finger hurts. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> like, put me out of my misery. My finger hurts. Uh, back into it. Give me that overcoat of yours, Jack, he said to Jack Gallagher, as the latter was stripped for the noose. You won't need it now, replied Gallagher. About then, George Lane, one of the line of men about to be hung, jumped off his box of his own account. There's one gone to hell, remarked Boone Helm, philosophically. Unquote. Yeah, he's probably trying to so, snap his neck so he didn't have to hang there until he'd be dead. Yeah, yeah, he took his death into his own hands. I mean, can you be any more dramatic? And then the first guy to die, he's like, hey, give me your jacket, man. You're not going to need it. <laughs> You're not going to need it. What the hell? I mean, at this point, Jack Gallagher was over his bullshit. Such an ass. Like, definitely a sociopath. Oh, absolutely a sociopath. Boone was the last in line to be hanged. They were all hanged one at a time in a row. And when Helm saw Jack Gallagher's box kicked out from under him, he said, quote, Kick away, old fellow. My turn next. I'll be in hell with you in a minute. Unquote. Such so, interesting last words. Such a drama queen. Well, that wasn't his last words. Stand by. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Before the executioner could get to Helm and kick his box out from under him, Helm said, Every man for his principles. Hurrah for Jeff Davis. Let her rip. And then jumped from his box and killed himself. Those were his last words. Yeet. Um. <laughs> and thus weird... is the end of Boone Helm, the Kentucky cannibal. Such a weird drama queen. He was such a drama queen. Boone Helm is buried in Boot Hill Cemetery in Virginia City, Montana. His exact plot is unknown. The gang members' graves were originally marked with painted wooden grave markers, but they were removed in 1930 and put on display in a museum, which later burned down. Seems like a fitting end for the grave marker of an arsonist. Oh no, I hiccup. Sorry, help. <laughs> What'd you do? I have the hiccups. <laughs> no! Are we gonna have to wait until your hiccups are gone? <laughs> <laughs> We'll be right back after these messages. <laughs> so, Rose, how do you feel about Boone Helm? I imagine, like, a really short man. I don't know why. Maybe it's, like, a Napoleon complex type of thing. I don't know. I can't really um, tell. There's only one picture of him online, and honestly, I don't even know if it's really of him. Oh, yeah, that's right. Photography existed during that time. I always forget, like, it's been around for a while. It has, but, like, back in that day, it was when you had to, like, stand still for five minutes straight to get a single photo. Yeah. And I think it's super weird that the only, like, real information about him is from, because you were saying the article's from 1907, but he died, like, what, 40 years before that? It is, yeah. There's the only information that I could really find about him in the time he was actually alive was there was a listing for him on Find a Grave, mm -hmm. which I don't 100% trust because Find a Grave is a forum website and there were a lot of typos. 
yeah. in the listing for Boone Helm. So I don't really trust that. But again, someone who claimed to be a direct descendant of him did comment in that forum saying that he was born in 1828 and that like, like more information about him that only a family me member would have known. So what a lovely guy he was. Boonhelm. He seems like a real catch. So he ate people. Yeah. Okay. He did eat Continue. people. So because there's not a lot of public information about him, there's stories and anecdotes about him, but not a lot of, you know, factual information. So there's not a lot of media coverage on him either. The 1907 article that I quoted extensively, again, I'm sorry about that, was probably the most popular media on Boonhelm. I was really excited when I looked. I tried to find a movie about him and I got super excited because I saw a listing for one called Boone, the true story of America's original serial killer. And it had an IMDb article and everything, but it turns out it was in production. It has not been released. Ooh. It was supposed to star Lauren McCraley. It was listed as being in production on IMDb, but as of the page's last update in April 2017, its current status is unknown. Aww. Yeah, I'm really bummed about it because it seemed like it was going to be a really good movie, but there weren't any trailers. There was no known production status. So I think it, the project might have been abandoned. Yeah, they might have lost funding or something. It tends to happen a lot. Super disappointing because um, I love Netflix pick it up. movies like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Netflix pick it up. As far as the rest of the media on Boone Helm, I had to dive pretty deep into the Internet to find anything on him. That's scary. I... Oh, gosh. Does that mean the third page of Google? Dun, dun, dun. I think this was the second page of Google, actually. That's still a lot more than I would have done. If it's not on the first page, it's not worth it. <laughs> Honestly, it really isn't. Um, the next thing that I found was a video. It was a short documentary, about 30 minutes, about Boone Helm, and it was called Boone Helm, A Bad, Bad Man. That's pretty straight to the point. Pretty straightforward. It was posted on Vimeo in January of 2018. It was produced by, quote, Winter Quarters Productions and a local historical society. On YouTube, I found a royalty-free song called The Crypt of Boonhelm. It's described as a horror-slash-suspense-slash-orchestra piece. Released by Techno Axes Royalty Free Music on YouTube. Interesting. That's all I've got is on that. I think it is, but I don't have a musical ear, so I honestly don't so know. Check it out on our blog, guys. Yeah, it will be in the blog for you to make your own judgments on that. On the website. And that's all I could find on Boone Helm. There's, he's not a very well-known person from the old west which i think is a real shame because he was a very dangerous and notorious criminal and i think people should know more about him you hear that criminologist majors not me um <laughs> dive in some research do some do some stuff on him dive somebody on make him. a movie somebody please make a movie yes i want to watch it I want a movie, damn it. I want a movie on Boone Helm. That was so beautiful. I'm sorry. I was so excited, you know, it just came out of me. So excited. Your body just couldn't handle it. It's just my body was like, yeah, and it make its point. It did. Um, it did. Well, that's. No, I mean, like, it's pretty cool. I like it. I like this. I've never heard of Boone Helm before. I think a big contributor to the fact that he's kind of lost to history is the fact that he was only ever tried by vigilante justice he escaped actual legal action yeah because i mean the west like if it was if he was doing this on the east coast it'd be a whole different thing but the west was so like crazy and unorganized and absolutely i mean a, a lot of the west at that point in time weren't even 
states in the union. So there there wasn't organized towns, there wasn't organized police forces, and most of the justice was done by vigilantes. It was just, you know, neighbors and friends of people that were wronged going out and getting justice for themselves. So there's not a lot of public record on him, I think, for that reason. And I think Plus, that's... I'm sure the country had a bunch of other things going on since it was 1864. <laughs> Very you know, true. I mean, the East there Coast... There was kind w- of like a war happening. <laughs> the East Coast was a pretty dramatic t- uh, t- place at that point in time. <laughs> at that time. Oh, Everybody also... Everybody was fighting and stuff. That reminds me, the Find a Grave article that I found on mm-hmm. him, the Find a Grave listing, said that he was hanged for... Uh, being an arson, first and foremost, and secondly, for being a Confederate sympathizer. Ooh, we don't like those around here. Don't like those, not at all. And this was in Montana, mind you. So, fun fact: Montana's in the north. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Montana is very, very north. If you enjoyed this episode of Dinner and a Murder, please subscribe and tell your friends to tune in. For more information about the crimes I discussed today and the movies that I did not review, check out our website. (laughs) Please, please make a movie, Netflix. And if you want any more information about Prime Minister that I went to this week, that's also on the website. Please like and follow our Facebook page at D-A-A-M, damn, podcast. (laughs) Twitter, which is also D A A M Pod, and Instagram at Dinner in a Murder. Also, please rate and review us on iTunes and Facebook. It helps so much to get good reviews. That's how other people get to listen to us. So we appreciate that so much. Yes, all the good reviews. All I need all the compliments. All of them. Shower us with compliments. <laughs> it's all I need in my life. If you have any questions, comments, corrections, or want to leave a suggestion, you can message us on our Facebook page or email us at dinnerandamurderpod at gmail.com. And if you would like to help us keep this podcast going, please consider joining our Patreon. We have some really cool treats for you if you do, uh, but there are other ways to support us if you would like to do so, which you can find on our website. And all of our links that we mentioned are also on our link tree that's in the description. Uh, Chelsea. What? We have, we have a call for some listener stories, do we not? We do. You guys, we have an awesome new segment that we're starting. It is called... Rose? It is called Tea Time and a Crime. And in this segment... We will be taking your stories. We want your stories of true crime, paranormal, local legends and myths, anything you've got for us. We want to hear from the you. The creepy pastas. The creepy pastas. And the we will pastas. read them. We will yes, read and they them will be the of they will be available the last Tuesdays of every month. So try to get them in before the first of uh December, right? I I'm not sure. To make it for a December episode. Regardless, if you send us your stories, they will make it into Tea Time and Crime at they some point. They will hopefully make it into it. But if you want it to come into our, the December episode, try to get it to us before the first. But enjoy your Thanksgiving. Please be sure to tune in every Thursday. We put out a new episode every Thanks single for listening. week. We'll see you next Thursday. And... Are we doing it together? Oh, are we? <laughs> Damn it. I don't okay. Know. Let's do it right, together. Are you ready? ready? Right. One, two, three. Bon, bon appetit. appetit. <laughs> what? No. It was definitely at the same time. I literally said, what? <laughs>